suppose I have I have this question before me, then how do I address? So that's what I want to uh, tell before you. Now, in the first part, I would make it define mean arterial blood pressure. This is the simply simple, simple one. The mean arterial blood pressure is the average arterial pressure present during the entire cardiac cycle. It is the average pressure present in the entire cardiac cycle. The cardiac cycle comprises of ventricular systole and ventricular diastole. So that means it is the average pressure in the arteries during the ventricular systole and diastole. Now I have drawn here the pulse pressure. You can see this is a pulse wave. They say, let us assume that this is aortic pulse. Now, the from here, I'm just making it here, the arrowhead there. And from here to this notch is the systole. From here to the notch is the systole. So that means uh, systole is not a single one timed event. It is a event happening for a, a period of time. Uh, it is about 0.3 seconds on an average in when the cardiac rate is around 72 beats per minute or something like that. The diastole, if you are thinking starting from this point to the beginning of this, so that the beginning of this here, maybe diastole from this thing, it would be around uh, uh, 0.5 second. Okay, now let me come back. So that means uh, if I were to tell what is the average pressure in the arteries during the ventricular systole and diastole. Ventricular systole is this period, diastole is this period. And the average, if you want to take, you should take the, the area under this curve, area under this curve. And after taking the area under this curve, you have to make the uh, half of this area that would be the average pressure. So if you if you make that, that means it's an integrated area under this triangular uh, curve, triangular curve, if I were to tell. So now in that case, it would be the mean arterial pressure lies here. You can just see that I put the dotted line there. So it is near the uh, diastolic pressure. So now this that is why when we are trying to look at this thing, we will look at the systolic pressure. We will look at the diastolic pressure. We will try to calculate the pulse pressure. Then we will calculate the mean arterial pressure. Systolic pressure, the maximum pressure during systole. Maximum pressure during systole. Diastolic pressure is the minimum pressure during diastole. Diastole is from this point to this point. If you are looking at this point, this is the beginning of diastole. This is the end of the diastole. So that means it is the minimum pressure uh, during diastole. Pulse pressure is the uh, difference between the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure. Okay, so how to calculate the mean arterial pressure? The mean arterial pressure is calculated by diastolic pressure uh, plus one third of the pulse pressure. Suppose if I have to take the if I have to take the area area under the curve of this uh, uh, graph, so it will come up to this level, the integrated. Okay, so now, so this is computation I have already made. The mean arterial pressure is equal to diastolic pressure plus one third pulse pressure. I have taken, suppose we have the systolic pressure 120 millimeters of mercury, diastolic pressure 80 millimeters of mercury, and then the pulse pressure is 40 millimeters of mercury. Systolic minus diastolic is 40. Now, then mean arterial pressure is equal to diastolic pressure 80 and pulse pressure 40 divided by 3. That is one third of pulse pressure. That would be 93. This is a very simple calculations. Sometimes uh, you have some books. Uh, you have some books. Uh, they mention this. The, this. This is happening because very recently this is happening. Some books mention that mean arterial pressure uh, is equal to one third of systolic pressure plus two third of diastolic pressure. This is for computer programming purposes. So the, when the instantaneous mean arterial pressure has to be determined by the computer. So this, this 
this formula is used by those uh, uh, techs that is the non non biologists now if you are looking at this thing if you just look at that so now the mean arterial pressure is equal to diastolic pressure plus one third pulse pressure as i have written here so now i define it here diastolic pressure plus one third systolic pressure minus diastolic pressure so now i multiply it by 3 3 diastolic pressure plus sp minus dp divided by 3 if i make this so then you get the calculation something like that if you try to do this thing you will get this calculation sp by 3 and 2 by 3 dp so this is where you start exactly it is the same it is the same it is the computer people or the software people who wanted the easiness for them they have made otherwise it is the same one third pulse pressure okay so now that is what i have calculated here 120 by 3 that is the one third of systolic pressure and uh, 160 that is a 2 2 into diastolic pressure 160 divided by 3 so you add up all these things it will be 93 so it is 93 here so don't worry uh, you rather stick stick around this uh, uh, old uh, this thing so if at all you want to say you want to say you want to calculate the area under the curve and then go ahead okay that is just for uh, uh, clearing certain doubts uh, because uh, this formula is also correct and this formula is also correct and this formula is derived from this okay leaving aside that i have mentioned the definition i have mentioned how to calculate now i will tell what is the normal range of a mean arterial pressure and its importance before i move on to the uh, the control control mechanisms normal range of mean arterial pressure is between 70 to 100 mm of mercury 70 to 100 mm of mercury so now what is the if the mean arterial pressure is lesser maybe if it is lesser than 60 if it becomes 60 40 or uh, something like that the definitely it will compromise compromise the cerebral blood flow or blood flow to the vital organs so they go into ischemia or anoxic so the, this is uh, this is what happens the mean arterial pressure then if it is more than 110 sometimes it shoots up so that means the capillaries may rupture because they cannot hold the pressure the capillary pressure is uh, much lesser than what we are seeing so now if uh, at a higher pressure the capillary will rupture because they don't have the elastic tissue so then there may be a bleeding that may result in a stroke or ischemia like situations so this is the importance i mentioned now come back here what is the significance of this it is the pressure head or a driving force for the perfusion of uh, various tissues is the driving force that gives our perfusion the entire uh, organs all the organs in our body and this is one of the perfusion pressure now it is this pressure that baroreceptors are adjusted mean arterial pressure increases the baroreceptor activity increases the mean arterial pressure decreases the baroreceptor activity decreases and at at a pressure below 60 mm of mercury at a mean arterial pressure below 60 mm of mercury the baroreceptor activity almost uh, comes to zero or it ceases now there is something else something else will take over so that means uh, it is this pressure that determines the barrel discharge factor now coming back with the factors controlling the mep if you are looking at the mean arterial pressure it is the cardiac output times the peripheral resistance okay so that is the equation i am putting it here the mean arterial pressure is equal to cardiac output times the peripheral resistance now what is cardiac output cardiac output is heart rate and the stroke volume and uh, number 2 the peripheral resistance what is peripheral resistance that is equal to viscosity and the arteriolar uh, the reciprocal of the arteriolar radius that is the peripheral resistance whatever the chain factors altering the heart rate they will halt of the mean arterial pressure 
whatever the factors altering the stroke volume they will alter the mean arterial pressure whatever the factors which increase or decrease the viscosity they would alter the mean arterial pressure because if it is the peripheral resistance here or if there is a change in the arteriolar radius that will alter the peripheral resistance so considering that aspect i am just made uh, these factors controlling the heart rate the factors in terms of a nervous endocrine the intrinsic environmental the four factors i have mentioned in the nervous the autonomic nervous system sympathetic activity and parasympathetic activity the sympathetic activity increases the heart rate the parasympathetic decreases the heart rate the limbic system limbic system is emotion there are two type of emotions the positive emotions that is the angry and aggressiveness and uh, the excitement so they would uh, they would uh, activate the sympathetic and uh, the other sympathetic uh, other limbic component is which is associated with the septal nucleus uh, that is with the parasympathetic uh, that will decrease that is the apathy uh, the depression or uh, not in interested these are all parasympathetic that decreases the heart rate so this is a limbic system similarly the hypothalamus hypothalamus is a component of the limbic system whatever is happening in the hypothalamus would alter these uh, autonomic system especially the sympathetic or parasympathetic depending upon the situation so now so now that means all these things the whether limbic hypothalamic these in inputs uh, they all govern the alterations in the sympathetic and parasympathetic system these are the predominant factors now interplay so now all these things are brought about by interplay of bodily responses uh, like uh, emotion excitement exercise the circadian activity the diurnal activity a uh, growth and aging because as the age advances uh, you just see that uh, an infant is having a greater heart rate and as the uh, adolescence the heart rate decreases and again uh, after 55 or after 60 the heart rate increases wherein uh, uh, parasympathetic or autonomic activity uh, diminishes so that means uh, the growth and aging is uh, associated with the heart rate sleep so during sleep maybe in the midnight the heart rate is slow in the early morning heart rate is uh, around 6 o'clock in the morning uh, heart rate is increased because of the increase of the sympathetic activity sexual excitement will increase the heart rate so the flight in the fright responses so that means uh, this is con uh, concerned with the adrenal medulla the flight and the em emergency responses that is a flight and fight responses so these are emergency responses and other physiological changes uh, that would uh, that would uh, alter the autonomic functions and that brings about this now other factors like uh, uh, reflexes so various reflexes on, in our body so the cardiac uh, reflexes generated from the heart or the baro reflexes from the great vessels the chemo reflexes from the chemo receptor the central or peripheral or the nociceptive reflexes which are from the somatosensory and here in the somatosensory i would like to add the proprioceptive uh, reflexes proprioceptive reflexes are coming from the proprioceptive from the the muscles and joints when we are doing the exercise then j reflex this is a j reflex is the juxta pulmonary capillary reflex or a pulmonary is also known as a pulmonary c reflex that will produce the bradycardia activation of these receptors produce bradycardia or decrease the heart rate the bejold cherish reflex these are uh, the the cardiac receptors uh, the bejold cherish reflex these are the excitation of the cardiac receptors of the uh, they will produce the decrease the heart rate thermal reflexes because of the increased the temperature increases the heart rate and these reflexes are regulated by the hypothalamus and also by the the medullary components valsalva maneuver that is a, a closed glottis forceful expiration with the closed glottis so that would alter the the hemodynamics and change the heart rate and similarly the opposite of valsalva maneuver is a, a muller's uh, maneuver the muller's maneuver also alter the heart rate changes 
Now you have a number of visceral reflexes originating from the uh, thoracoabdominal viscera. So those those reflexes maybe the bladder, bowel, and all those things will alter the the heart rate and other somatic reflexes. So these are the various reflex changes that are concerned with the nervous system. Now endocrine, endocrine factors like uh, thyroid. Thyroid, you just see that in a high, uh, thyroid, uh, these things, uh, uh, hyperthyroidism will have an increased resting heart rate. The uh, sleeping heart rate or uh, the resting heart rate is increased. So thyroxine increases the activity. So in case of a myxedema, that is the hypothyroid state, heart rate is slowed down. So that means thyroxine is a stimulant. Now we have the adrenal gland already we have covered with a flight and fight response that would be sympathetic, so that would increase. The growth hormone, because it is associated with the growth, and that, that would be uh, also in relation with the circadian activity. So then other third component, it is existing within the heart, that is the pacemaker activity. The pacemaker activity, if it is increasing or decreasing, how it is set, or if there are any abnormal pacemakers, so all those things also determine the heart rate. So, or if it is uh, the slope of the uh, pacemaker potential, what is called a pre-potential. If it is happening faster, the heart rate is faster. If it is happening slower, heart rate is slower. So the in that is the intrinsic activity. Now the environmental factors, especially the ambient temperatures. Ambient temperature means the, in the heart and the cold environment. In a hot environment, uh, there is a sweating and all those things. Uh, they, uh, this is a different aspect. Uh, you, may, you may slow down, the activity is slow down. In a cold environment, there is an increased energetic activity. So that means uh, uh, you have the increased heart rate. These are the factors which govern the heart rate. Now coming back uh, with the stroke volume. What are the factors are uh, covering the stroke volume? So now I am I am covering in the in the stroke volume two factors. The factor A, which is homeometric. Homeometric means independent of length changes. B, heterometric, that is associated with the length changes. Factor one, which is associated with the length changes, uh, independent of the length changes, and this is associated with the length changes. These homeometric regulations. Uh, or due to the intrinsic changes in the myocardial contractility. That means uh, you can have these uh, uh, intrinsic increased contractility. Maybe one of those hormones is a thyroxine or even the excitation contraction coupling happening. So that is uh, uh, one of those things just I have mentioned here thyroxine or any intrinsic activity that is the that is one one factor. Now the second factor is uh, these intrinsic or homeometric changes are due to the increased calcium availability because uh, for the excitation contracts and coupling calcium is required calcium increased calcium availability and that could be brought about that is what it is known as a staircase phenomena if there is a frequent the heart rate is faster or it is if it is frequently stimulated, you will see the staircase effect increase, increase in the dose. So this is, a, this is known as a, a Bowditch effect. It is not due to the length change. It is due to the increased calcium availability. So that means you are stimulating at an earlier, faster frequency, so that calcium is not getting back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and that would increase the uh, contraction. So that is a Bowditch effect. So this is also known as a Bowditch effect. There is another another effect which is known as a NREF effect. The NREF effect, maybe many of your books may not have a reference date. Uh, here I will just making an explanation here. An abrupt increase in afterload. So that means uh, afterload is uh, the aortic. So if there is a uh, aortic stenosis or uh, the correctation of iota or if there is a severe blood pressure so abrupt increase in the afterload can cause increase in the uh, contractility and this has been explained on the basis of uh, 
uh, the initially there is a subendocardial ischemia and this in is this is followed by improvement in the uh, circulation coronary circulation and that increases the uh, contractility so that the ventricle wants to force the uh, contents into the aorta because they want to open up they want to push it so that is an interrupt effect so that means abrupt increase in afterload in that case the ventricle wants to push further so this can only happen one time it cannot happen forever so this is a end of effect so this is also increases the contractility so now then we have number four factors these are homeometric the various events which increases the which mobilizes calcium like caffeine caffeine is a phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor that increases the uh, calcium availability calcium availability because of opens up the calcium channels janthines so this is part of the Caffeine there, glycosides that will digitalize uh, stropentin. So they will increase the, because they block the uh, sodium potassium ATPase pump, and by, by blocking the sodium potassium ATPase pump, they will allow the calcium to move in because of the calcium exchanger, sodium calcium exchanger system, epinephrine. Epinephrine also increases the contractility. So these are homeometric. Then parasympathetic stimulation or parasympathetic system decreases the contractility. To consider now the pers vagus supplies the atrium or the atrial. The ventricles are sparsely supplied. So now even if it is if there is a excessive activity, so it will have it will decrease the contractility of the atrium. So uh, it's other way. So the ventricles may be may not have that much effect but anyway if there is a greater uh, spillover so that's not a possibility so but that decreases the contractility because the vagus by itself having a negative anotropic action then temperature effects that means the increased temperature of the heart or in, in the fevers the cardiac contractility increases in hypothermia it decreases these are all independent of the length changes. Now, if, if you come back here, what are the factors which are dependent upon the length changes? So that means the venous return. Venous return increases, increases the end diastolic volume. And if there is an increased end diastolic volume, there is a greater force of contraction. That is what the Starling's law. So I have not written Starling's law here, but the way this is a, uh, precisely Starling's law because there's a greater end diastolic volume. Then sympathetic actions. Again, sympathetic actions, what happens? It is in terms of the ventricular filling and uh, the entire uh, movement of the blood flows that increases the venous return. Though parasympathetic I have mentioned here, it has the homeometrically, it is a negative, negative component. Here what is happening slows down the heart rate by slowing down the heart rate, the diastolic filling is increased. Diastolic filling increases the end diastolic volume and the Starling's effect that increases. But uh, this is balanced. These two get balanced. So maybe they will not be active. Then preload. Anything which increases the venous return. Maybe the venous return may depend upon a number of factors, including the thoracic and the abdominal pumps. So they will uh, uh, increase the, uh, the end diastolic volume and uh, they will increase the force of contraction. Afterload, though afterload in the, as an interrupt effect, but the continuous afterload, the ventricular filling is greater. They try to uh, enhance the force of contraction. They want to throw it. Thyroid, adrenal growth hormone try to increase the uh, heterometric activity also. They will try to enhance the heterometric activity. Or any factor which increases the hemodynamic circulation, just like uh, anemia, uh, beriberi, or uh, arteriovenous fistula, and all those things uh, uh, will, uh, will increase the venous return or uh, and, uh, greater end diastolic filling and uh, increase the uh, length changes. So it is a length changes. It is a Starling's law. Okay, so now, we move on to the next, uh, what are the factors which uh, affect the peripheral resistance? Now, vascular resistance is defined by Wurm's law. I'm just going through this thing. 
normally the pressure gradient is constant and the flow is regulated by vascular resistance this is measured in dynes per sec dynes into second per centi per five centimeter raised to the five these are the units for that the alveolars are having a diameter about uh, 200 200 micrometers and they are the main site for the resistance now this resistance is dependent by this biophysical formula hagen paisule law or hagen paisule equation or paisule's equation paisule hagen's equation because you may get this thing as a short note so here resistance is equal to 8 times the length of the arterial segment or the tube and times the viscosity of the blood or the fluid flowing through the tube divided by pi r r is the radius the power 4 8 l nu divided by pi r 4 so that is what the length is the length of the vessel the length of the vascular tree is a constant hence we are not bothered about it the new is the viscosity of the blood and um, the r is the radius of the vessel now let us consider this new and the radius because now the peripheral resistance now it is uh, perfectly controlled by these two important uh, parameters now this is the viscosity of the blood how it is being affected so the smaller the diameter of the vessels vessel diameter the viscosity decreases so that is uh, uh, what is the typ typical uh, phenomena so that that is that's what happens the hematocrit if the hematocrit increases uh, the celluloids or the cells increase and they would add to the viscosity so the suppose you have a rbc count more than uh, uh, the 7 or 8 million per cubic millimeter the normal rbc count is 5 million per cubic millimeter so viscosity increases so in that case the uh, the resistance peripheral resistance increases now the protein content especially because the viscosity is determined by colloids and the celluloids i mentioned about celluloids there the colloids are proteins this protein content of the plasma if it is higher so the viscosity increases if the protein content is low hypoproteinemia the viscosity decreases so especially the fibrinogen fibrinogen increases the viscosity a great extent because of its molecular uh, size and its property now other lipid contents of the blood uh, so because you have those uh, uh, phospholipids and other lipids uh, the lipid profiles in the blood they will also increase the viscosity then uh, suppose if somebody else is using the plasma expanders especially we give in uh, in patients uh, wherein we give uh, uh, these gelatin or starch that we try to increase that but they will not have this uh, viscosity so they that will uh, decrease the resistance the temperature so the viscosity is inversely proportional to the temperatures so it increases with the low temperatures and at a higher temperature the viscosity decreases so that's what it is so now i have mentioned the vessel diameter so that means uh, the if it is a smaller diameter vessels the viscosity is less hematocrit so this is an anomaly but this is uh, existing the hematocrit s that's one thing increases the viscosity the proteins suppose if there are uh, we, i cannot see an increased protein uh, situation i will see the decreased protein situation or i will see only increased fibrinogen levels uh, in which you will get the greater viscosity so i will take it other way around hypoproteinemia decreases the viscosity so like that uh, you have a higher lipid contents or lipid profiles the you are using the 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 various plasma expanders they will not have this, as much as viscosity as the proteins and the temperature is having a inverse relation now coming back this is about a new then factors of the radius so now the factors which govern the radius include one systemic factors and the local or regional factors the systemic factors include 
the arterial baroreflex control. Now, this arterial baroreflex, so that means increased blood pressure decreases the systemic vascular resistance. So now let me tell, uh, let me explain this here. The increased blood pressure increases the barrow discharge. The increased barrow discharge will go to the NTS. From the NTS, it will come to the, uh, the CVLM and then RVLM that will decrease the, that will decrease the, the sympathetic activity. The decrease in sympathetic activity. That means at the end, what is happening? There is a increased barrow activity. Means increased pressure. This has to be decreased. End result is a decrease in the sympathetic activity. So that is one aspect. The barrow reflex. It is uh, increased and decreased. If there is a decreased uh, blood pressure, in case of a decreased blood pressure, what is happening here? So the uh, barrow discharge decreases, and because barrow discharge is decreased, the sympathetic activity increases the systemic vascular resistance increases the peripheral and central chemoreceptors that is a hypoxic stimulation they will increase the systemic vascular resistance by stimulating the sympathetic centers in the medulla the hormones especially the epinephrine norepinephrine the thyrox and uh, t3 and t4 from the thyroid gland vasopressin that will also increase the uh, resistance and angiotensin 2, especially angiotensin 2, they will increase the, the blood. These are systemic factors. This is angiotensin 2 is coming from uh, lungs, but uh, the angiotensin 1 is in the blood. Renin is in the kidney. Renin activates the angiotensinogen and forms angiotensin 1 in the plasma. And angiotensin 1 reaches the lung where it is converted to angiotensin 2, which is a potent vasoconstrictor, alters the arteriolar constriction. The temperature, hypothermia increases the, so independent of the reflex activity, the decreased temperature uh, produces the spasm. So that means uh, uh, that is an increased systemic vascular resistance. This is, or in case of a hyperthermia, that is a lucent sign that is decreases the systemic vascular resistance. These are systemic factors. So what, what I am trying to see here, whether this factor or this factor, they are all concerned with the sympathetic activity. They are primarily concerned with the sympathetic activity. You are just, you can just put them as sympathetic. And then here comes hormones and the temperature. Now, the other factors, the parasympathetic, that would decrease. So they decrease the, it does not supply, the parasympathetic nerves do not supply the blood vessels, excepting for the, the sweat glands. Sweat glands are supplied by the sympathetic cholinergic fibers. Sweat glands are supplied by the sympathetic cholinergic fibers where they secrete a style choline where, uh, for which we are going to sweat. So that is a, that's again a sympathetic activity. The, there are no parasympathetic uh, supply to the blood vessels. Take it. So now the local factors, these local factors include the myogenic uh, responses. These are intrinsic myogenic, the smooth muscle activity. They respond to stretch. They respond to cold, as I mentioned. They respond to the metabolites. So that is the myogenic regulation. Then uh, the metabolites may include all those carbon dioxide, oxygen, and uh, the various uh, potassium, uh, adenosines, so on, the number of factors. The metabolic regulation in response to the increased demand so these metabolic regulation again they, they include the carbon dioxide the potassium adenosine adp the other all other things so they will be producing the relaxation of these muscles the flow suppose if the blood flow is uh, uh, turbid or it is not a laminar so in that situation so that will have a shear stress on the, the endothelial cells. The shear stress on the endothelial cells uh, generates uh, certain, amount, certain molecules, especially the nitric oxide. So this nitric oxide uh, produces uh, the dilatation. 
dilatation. So that means uh, they will try to regulate the blood flow by either uh, dilating or uh, altering the uh, CR, uh, CR stress associated with the regulation. Then vasomotor uh, response is uh, depending upon the neighboring tissues, neighboring vascular sites. Uh, they will be influencing the, the local factors. The local cooling, which leads to vasoconstrictions. We see whenever in the winter, our all uh, uh, blood vessels constrict and you have these uh, uh, cyanosis in the peripheral sites. So that is the vasoconstriction. And then uh, again, vasodilatation in case of the summer season. So then immunological modulation of the inflammatory mediators. These inflammatory mediators I've listed here, serotonin, 5-HT, histamine, prostaglandins, Lycotrines, cytokines, nitric oxide, the free radicals, the carbon dioxide, ATP, ADP, ADP, adenosines, so on. You can add a number of other factors. So these are the various factors which alter the radius of the arterioles. Regulation of MAP happens in two, two components. One in relation to time and two in relation to the various systems. Let us concern with uh, the uh, the in relation to time, that means we say that it is a short-term regulation, intermediate regulation, long-term regulation. System-wise, this is the regulation from the nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, regulation from the hormonal system or endocrine, regulation from the kidney, regulation from the cardiorespiratory reflexes, regulation resulting from the microcirculation. So these are the uh, five components system-wise if we, if we look into. Now, I would mainly concentrate regulation in, re in response to time because that covers up all these uh, uh, five, five main areas. Regulation of AMAP in relation to time. So this is a short-term regulation, intermediate regulation, and long-term mechanisms. Short-term mechanisms operate between seconds and minutes, and they involve neural reflexes. So they are the baroreflexes, number one, the chemoreflexes, number two, and the ischemic, uh, central ischemic response or a brain ischemic response or a Cushing's uh, response. These baroreflex mechanisms uh, operate whenever the blood pressure falls and uh, the fall is up to uh, 60 millimeters of mercury, up to 60 millimeters of mercury. The barrow discharge decreases. The decrease in the barrow discharge will uh, not stimulate the NTS and the NTS, uh, the decreased um, inhibition of the sympathetic system, so the sympathetic activation takes place. So disinhibition of sympathetic activation, that increases the sympathetic activity. At the same time, this would also disinhibit the, inhibits the uh, parasympathetic activity, the, the dorsal vagal nucleus and the nucleus ambiguous, so that heart rate increases and the blood pressure also increases because of the sympathetic uh, activity. So that is a baroreflex mechanism. If the MAP falls below 60 millimeters of mercury here in this situation, chemoreceptors. So below 60 millimeters and uh, uh, 40, 60, between below 60 and below above 40. So this mechanism operates. These are central and peripheral, especially the peripheral chemoreceptors. These peripheral chemoreceptors from the aortic body and the carotid body, they reach to the NTS and they would stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. They would stimulate the sympathetic nervous system directly. Or these chemoreceptors in the central chemoreceptors, they will activate the uh, sympathetic ner nervous system uh, straight. Then third component, uh, the central ischemic response. This operates whenever the blood MAP falls below 40 millimeters of mercury. So now what I have mentioned, 40, this is 60 to 40 there and 100 to 60. So 40 millimeters. This is the final call, a ditch effort. So that means uh, it is the final effort to revive the blood pressure. This is the central nervous system that would activate the sympathetic system uh, through the uh, hypothalamus and uh, the uh, medullary sympathetic activation. So this is short-term regulation. This happens in case of uh, uh, seconds to minutes. It is seconds. Then it is maybe in minutes. It may be five minutes or so, something like that.
So now, intermediate mechanisms. So these intermediate mechanisms operate in reference to hours. So that means uh, this is happening here. Then uh, after one hour, uh, something else, because uh, these baroreflexes are operative. In addition to that, some other things uh, start uh, building up uh, to help the baroreceptors or help these receptors. These involve the hormonal and biophysical factors. Now, coming to the hormonal, the first thing is uh, renin angiotensin vasoconstrictor mechanism begins. That means the, the renin is secreted from the juxtaglomerular complex of the uh, kidneys, and this renin uh, activates the angiotensin which then present a plasma protein present in the uh, plasma, and that forms the angiotensin one, and that angiotensin one reaches the the pulmonary uh, the lungs or the pulmonary circulation where it is converted to angiotensin two. Angiotensin two is a, a potent vasoconstrictor and increases the blood pressure. Already the blood pressure is increased by the sympathetic activity here, and this would further enhance it or further add to this thing. Then, uh, because here stress relaxation of the vasculature. So in case of the fall in pressure, in case of the fall in pressure, it is a inverse stress relaxation. In case of the rise in pressure, it is the stress relaxation. So that means if it is the pressure is falling, so that means it is a biophysical mechanism. Biophysical mechanism, that means the elastic tissue wants to recoil. So that means inverse stress relaxation. So that means that would increase the uh, tension. Then third component is the fluid shift, fluid shift across the capillary. Suppose if there is a fall in the pressure, the fluid in the inter interstitial compartment enters into the capillary and into the vessels. That's the reverse. Usually the fluid goes from the capillaries into the tissues. Now it comes, enters back into the into the capillaries. That is the uh, fluid shift across the capillary. Suppose if there is increased pressure, the fluid moves into the um, interstitial space. So these two are happening. Again, it is a biophysical uh, uh, factor. Then third thing is uh, the activation of the ADH and uh, uh, the water conservation water conservation and the thirst begins. If there is a fall in the pressure, it will activate ADH so that the pressure is restored. Pressure is restored on two counts, then restoring the fluid volume and increasing the activity because ADH is a vasopressin that increases the activity. And at the same time, this would activate the thirst center so that you increase the water intake, water intake, and that will try to resolve the, the blood volume. So this is how the intermediate mechanisms operate. Now, if these intermediate mechanisms, if they are not covered with, so then uh, the long-term mechanisms begin. So these operate uh, 24 to 72 hours. That means uh, it is in days. It is in days. They involve renal, cardiac, endocrine mechanisms. The first thing is the renal mechanisms involve already the angiotensin 2 has been formed renin angiotensin 2. Now angiotensin 2 is a stimulant for aldosterone secretion. Aldosterone try to restore the sodium reabsorption. That means sodium reabsorption from the uh, distal nephron. And that increases the uh, fluid volume. That means plasma volume. So that is how this will try to increase the volume. And uh, if it is a loss, if it is an increase, this would uh, not be happening and then sodium loss would be there. Then another factor is coming, atrial natriuretic peptide. So atrial natriuretic peptide, if there is greater stretch of the atria, if there is an increased pressure, so that means that increased pressure means increased uh, plasma volume. So now it will activate the uh, secrete this uh, adrenergic peptide and that will enhance the excretion of the uh, sodium. Sodium that is an atrioresis from the distal nephron. Then uh, so again atrial stretch also adds to the ADH mechanism. So if there is a great if there is a less atrial stretch ADH is secreted. So it is inverse relation. It's inverse relation. So again, inverse relation with a, a thirst mechanism. 
So these are the various uh, uh, regulatory aspects I briefly touched upon uh, for the uh, regulation of the mean arterial pressure. Now, uh, with this thing, I end the 